for 170 first class passengers. So there was a lot of stuff going on at the time. But very hard, if you look back to the records, um, very seldom were they making money, even though there's a lot of throughput, it was still very hard to make money. Obviously, they were fighting the whole time against Dublin and Belfast and Cork to some degree. Um, on one particular night, anyway, the, the Connemara, which is, you couldn't give a talk without mentioning the Connemara and um, Connemara and the Retriever. The Connemara was one such ship. And on the 3rd of November 1916, as it had done many nights before, it set out from the pier at Greenow. And uh, just past Holborn Lane, just past Holborn Lane, and no, that's right. just past Holborn Lane, um, just past Holborn Lane, uh, just past the Holborn Lane Lighthouse. The retriever was on its way in from Garston with a load of coal, a coal collier, and had a particularly bad passage over, and the weather was horrific. And with the load of coal had shifted, and the, the ship was now listing. So um, the Connemara is going out, and the retriever's coming in. And in most times, um, any or more other times, there was plenty of room for them meeting the cut, which was very considerably choppy. But on this particular night, just as it was passing, a wave caught the retriever and pushed it into the side of the Connemara. Both ships sunk um, in less than 10 minutes. There was only one survivor, James Boyle, who, who was only 18 at the time. Actually, he lived until he passed away in 1967. So he lived a good life after. But James Boyle was the only survivor. There were 94 people lost, 94 lives lost. And I'm gonna, we're going to hand you over now at the moment to to two Mac and T sisters. This was a very bad night. In fact, people were wondering, was this boat ever going to sail? And they were on the way in. And these two ladies, these two sisters were from County Monaghan on their way over to meet relatives in America. they would tell you what it was like on the three on that day. God bless all here. You're right there, sister. We learned that greeting from our father and him from County Clare. Should thank heavens we are not from Clare. No, we were born and bred in a place called Bally Bay in the County Monaghan. And it was lovely to meet another lady on the train from Monaghan. Oh, I must say, it's great to get in out of that storm. I think it's getting worse. Actually, the train took an awful bathroom from the waves after we passed across the laney and onto the seaward tracks. And would you believe it, there was chumps of seaweed to call all around the carriages when we finally arrived into Green Ore Station. Well, I envied some of them passengers disembarking in Green Ore and they were heading for their nice warm fire and bedsteads. Yeah, there was only one woman in our apartment that wasn't heading on to the boat. And she was a newly qualified teacher, but more importantly, a newly wedded woman. Ah, a lovely girl indeed. Angela Dwyer was her name. And her husband, Thomas, is an employee of the GNR. And there was another woman on the train and she had two each along with her. Ah, that's right, Annie. But she didn't take much part in the conversation. She was suffering from an awful toothache. She was on her way to meet her husband in Liverpool and she was holding on to them two wee children or they were terrified of the waves slashing up on the windows of the carriages. Now one was a wee boy and he was about four. He had a lovely wee blue suit on him and the wee girl was six and she had the most beautiful red coat. Now those children are our future hope for a utopian world free from hate and prejudice. Well, I'm looking round me at 13 soldiers waiting to board this ship. And do you know, most of them look like they should still be at a national school. Well, do you know, I agree with you, Lizzie. And I know it's an awful comment to make, but how many will survive this terrible war? And all because one crazy lunatic taught the world to be a safer place if he assassinated the Duke and his wife. 
I wonder just how bad it is at the front line. Ah, sure, all we hear is what's in the papers, and I'm sure the real truth is never reported. Oh, I hope we don't have a rough voyage across him tonight, and we all arrive safely in Hollyhead. Oh, there's the call for us to board the Connemara. Right, we better get going. Are we back, yeah? Well, as we mentioned, that was the two Mag and T sisters who uh, boarded the Connemara that night. And unfortunately, like 94 others, uh, unfortunately didn't make the other side. We should have mentioned that the, the Connemara was 1106 tons, 270 foot long, constructed in 1897. And the retrieval, the coal carrier retrieval was uh, 483 tons, um, 168 foot long, which was constructed in 1889. So there we have the Connemara. And, and entrance into Greenow Port. And we're going to have the retrieval in a moment. A wee bit of a hold up. Artist impression of the retrieval. There is no uh, picture of the retrieve. Now, on that ship that night, there were um, eight to ten soldiers, and they were not connected in any way. But we're heading back. Some had been over for funeral. Some had been over for wedding. Some had been injured on the front as the world war was raging on the front of this time, and uh, they were also lost, of course. And through research of one of our actors, um, Richard, who you'll hear from next, he will give you the story of uh, Private Edwin Carter, who was actually interred in the Holy Trinity graveyard. Which I Hey Richard, are you okay? Yes. So my name is uh, Edwin Wrighton Carter. I was born in Holloway, London in 1899. I was the uh, youngest child and only son of Wrighton Carter. I was very disappointed that when the war started, I was only a young lad of 15. I so wanted to join up and do my bit for king and country. So in 1916, when the war didn't end in Christmas 1914, like we were told, I uh, went with my father, because I had just turned 17, I went with my father to sign up in Cricklewood, where we lived in London. So we went down and he signed for me. And the recruiting sergeant said to me, oh, well, my son, uh, uh, what would you like to join? And I said, oh, I'd, I'd like to join the cavalry, please. And so I signed up. He said, have you got any skills? I said, well, I'm, I'm musical. He said, uh, excellent, we need trumpeters. And so I became trumpeter Edwin Wrighton Carter of the first King Edward's horse. I was sent off for training, immediately boarding a ship, but not heading for the front in France. We went to Ireland. I ended up in a place called the Curra in County Kildare, where all the cavalry regiments went. And so I was there in April 1916, when we got word that there'd been trouble in Dublin, some sort of rebellion. So we were mobilized and sent to Athlone, to guard some artillery pieces in case the rebels got their hand on them, but nothing happened. We didn't see anything and, and we continued with our training. 
After months of training in Ireland, I finally got a pass to go home and see my parents in London. And so I left the Cara, went by train to Dublin, Dublin to Dundalk, Dundalk to Greenore. I was to get the SS Connemara, travel with the London Northwestern Railway to Hollyhead and on to Euston in London. I must say I was apprehensive that night. The storm was terrible. I'd never traveled on a ship in such a storm. But one old soldier said to me, oh, you'll be all right, Sonny. It's, it's fine. This ship has traveled this many times and there's never been any problems. And so we set off from Greenwood just after eight o'clock on the Friday night, the 3rd of November. The storm was terrible. And as we got beyond the Hulbeline lighthouse, the storm seemed to be even worse. The last thing I remember down below, it was very dark. And the next thing I heard, a, a crunch of metal. Seawater came pouring in. Steam was all around me. And I remember no more. Apparently, it was several weeks before my body was washed up on shore. I was recovered late, according to the official record of the London Northwestern Railway. My parents were devastated. They agreed that rather than bringing my remains home, that I should be buried where I was found. And so I was buried in a grave in Holy Trinity Church in Carlingford. My parents declined the offer of a Commonwealth War Grave headstone and put up their own marble cross and surround on the grave and put lead lettering on it to commemorate me. And there I lay. My parents died. My sisters died. My family had forgotten about me. In 2012, the 96th commemoration of the sinking of the Connemara and Retriever, Two gentlemen had a chance meeting. One was an avid historian from Warren Point who was really interested in the story of the ship. The other was a gentleman from Downpatrick. The gentleman from Downpatrick told a story about a daughter of his who lived in England. He was married to a chap and this chap said that their next door neighbor had an interesting story. So Mr. Dickinson talked to this chap from Down Patrick's daughter and said, oh, my uncle died in Ireland on board a ship. Chap from Warren Point was intrigued with the story and he said to the chap from Down Patrick, and what was the name of this soldier? And he said, oh, his name was Edwin Wright and Carter, but we don't know where he's buried. The chap from Warren Point said, oh, I'll take you to his grave right now. And so they went to Carlingford. The chap from Down Patrick couldn't believe the story. He was on the phone immediately to my nephew in London, Mr. Dickinson, immediately telling him the story that the grave had been found. By 2013, plans were made to restore my grave. And by 2014, I had a new surround, new marble at the top, new cross, new lead lettering. And hopefully for the next hundred years, people will see and remember me in loving memory of Edwin Wrighton Carter, aged 17 years and seven months, trumpeter, King Edward's horse, perished in the Connemara disaster, November the 3rd, 1916. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Uh, slide in front of you. Thank you very much, Richard. Well done, as always. You see the slide in front of you there, we have been over in October 1923. 
through the last over the last 25 years I've taken a keen interest in, in the in research and going over as much as I can um, and I've interviewed some very decent people <clears throat> who walked on the trains and one thing or another who have passed on to to greater we all we all to this stage but um, I interviewed one Dan Brennan who was actually born in Greenore and joined the railway at 17 years of age <clears throat> and uh, funnily enough I, I'm just looking through my notes and he mentioned that there was a fellow called uh, Henry Harold who was a station master some of you might have heard about him was the station master and obviously he always thought him to be a very decent fella so it was worth, worth mentioning when I consume my notes anyway um, he tells us this picture here he tells us that whenever the other ports would strike because we know it was separate, as we mentioned all along, to the Dublin and the Corks and the Belfast. Whenever they would go and strike, which they did regularly in other ports, we know it wouldn't strike. They would take all the boats they could get, and he would walk around the clock, and he said it was like manna from heaven. Whenever They were hoping for strikes everywhere else. But here's a picture anyway, 1923. And believe it or not, even in 1923, with the strikes on and so much traffic going through the port, uh, they were progressively losing money, even lost £12,000 that year. Losses rose to £25,000. Um, and then the, the, the nails were going into the coffin, to be quite honest. Um, 1926 was the year of the general strike, and they still didn't, they still didn't generate a profit. So uh, after 1926, the passenger service between Hollyhead and Greenore never resumed, to be quite honest. Cargo and livestock sailings continued three days per week. According to an interview with Dan, um, the, G the Great Northern Ireland took over the walking and maintenance, including the Greenore Hotel, from the DN DNNG on the 1st of July 1933. And he didn't have much time for the new manager who was... Uh, I can't remember his first name, but Nathan Gale was his surname. And he said that when he came in, he was going to make all the changes. And immediately started laying people off, drivers and staff, and uh, steadily going downhill. And Dan himself had to take the boat to go to England to work, which was the thing of the time. So um, continued to lose money. And eventually closure was announced on the fateful day of the 31st December 1951. Um, the last train out of the dock was uh, on the night of the 31st December 1951 was driven by Barney Dullivan and the guard was P.G. Rafferty and the fireman was Hugh Rafferty and as, as things would have a Hugh Rafferty it was an engine number 93 and Hugh Rafferty is still with us today at 94 years of age himself so he was actually the fireman the fireman to fire the last train on the Green Ore Lane in 1951, is Q Rafferty still with us? And we also have Josie Breen in Dublin, who was also a fireman on the lane. Um, it took it usually take it used to take 50 minutes coming from Mondorf on the lane, and that night it took three times that because people kept pulling the cords on the lane to stop the train, and there were firecrackers banging all over the place. On the one from Uri, you had driver was Edward Boyd. Eddie Boyne. And the guard was Thomas Carroll. And the fireman was Teddy Bears. And we're told there were 400 passengers and new return band on the train and a goat, which they picked up along the way for, for a bit of fun. There was obviously a goat somewhere on there, took the goat along with them. And the story is legendary where they stopped at all pubs along the way and had to test out all the <laughs> imbibed along the way anyway. And um, in Carringford, at the station house in Carringford, all left the train, a whole lot left the train and up into O'Hare's or wherever to, to, to get drink. Uh, everybody, it was a kind of a source of enjoyment. I remember Hugh Rafferty telling me it was a source of enjoyment for everybody else except us, he says, because we had no job. They all had to head off to England for walking on the train, you know. The Sleeve League made the last sailing from Greenore, Hollyhead two days previously. So um, 
I just like to, when I see if I end else, I just want to finish off. I'm a bit mixed up, there was that much to tell, but I hope it sounded okay. Um, here we have, we have, a, we, we do reenactments and Rostrevor, uh, Historical Society were here and we've done a reenactment. You see the picture of Janice. This is an old one on the left. This is one we picked up on the internet of. It's actually mentioned, we know, to be quite honest, but um, it's just one of the things. Here is the, here is the port in Hollyhead. We've been there a number of times. So we know a boat has its own separate position in Hollyhead, which is still there. So the boat went over, and this is where the people disembarked over in Hollyhead. Connemara, retriever. These are the, the the Galtie Moor for us Trevor. These are the ships that were running back and forth. Got an early picture of the golf club and people out on the golf links, of course. Here is your, your um, people may have seen these before. This is the Dodder. This is the one running back and forth across uh, the, the land. Now, this is quite a unique, unique picture here because it's a picture taken on board. Obviously, this shows you how people traverse back and forth. I know we have a ferry now, and I, I must mention that this year is the centenary year of the initial ferry closing. It's important to mention that. Radio Caroline, so there's the name. Radio Caroline, uh, of course, the radio, higher radio ship Caroline, which was owned by Rowan O'Reilly, was actually fitted out in Greenough Port. His dad, Ron O'Reilly, or Egon O'Reilly, owned the port and uh, went on air in Easter 1964. And here's something I'd like to share with you. We have, um, where we all talk about tourism and trying to link up, which is all good, north and south. Uh, sometimes we don't realize where we actually live. And here's something here we, we have contacts with groups in Hollyhead and this was picked up by one of them in the John Pritchard Jones Institute um, Library in Hollyhead and it says that uh, if I can read it right Thackeray, visiting, Thackeray on visiting Carlingford Lock said if such a bay were on English shores it would be a world's wonder so I think it's fair enough to leave it to Thackeray tonight well, thank you very much for listening I hope it sounded all right uh, I thank you very much for the opportunity and please come along and uh, we'll see you along. As I, as I mentioned, there's a lot to tell. I should mention, by the way, on the last, on the last uh, year of workings of the Dundalk Year in Greenore Railway. So in, the 34, in, in, in 1951, there were 194,000 passengers went through the port of Greenore, uh, first, second and third class. And there were 5,600 animals uh, transported on that year. Now, if the people that constructed the port of Green Ore at that time had uh, envisaged what was going to happen, first of all, Egon O'Reilly bought it off the railway. Um, he started to build up cargoes, and a lot of people who would be listening would be familiar with it, a lot more familiar than I am that worked with it. Uh, he sold it to 151 Group in 2006, and the Doyle Group have since bought it over since that. So the, the, the wharf, or the small vessel, the small ship, the small wharf that invited vessels in of 12 and 1,300 tonnes are now dealing with ships of 30 and 40,000 tonnes. And last year, through Greenough Port, there was one... Over 1 million tons of cargo come through the North Port last year. So if the people that had constructors could have envisaged what it would have developed into. Uh